אוקיי? אוקיי. Good morning or good evening wherever are you around the world. Uh, so I'm glad to, to start this seminar. It becomes a little tradition because this is the third year in a row that I'm running this seminar. And according to some old tradition, I'm, I start to be worried because if you do something three times, you must continue forever. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but uh, as I enjoyed it uh, quite a bit, and I see according to the loyal audience, which come to, which still come with us from all, uh, all over the world, that, uh, I, uh, that some other people are also enjoying it. So let's, uh, let's continue. And um, again, I want to stress that this is a kind of a learning and research seminar. It's a kind of a learning and research seminar, which when we really want to learn various subjects, we don't have to talk about the most, uh, the last type of work. But uh, on the other hand, of course, we'll meet and I'm completely open-minded for suggestions for topics. In fact, I will, I hope you can suggest some topics that will be uh, of interest to, to many people. I remember once I came to give a talk at the University of Chicago and Bob Zimmer asked me to talk in the geometry seminar. Then I told him I have nothing to say about geometry. So he told me our definition of geometry is what we want to hear about. <laughs> so also, I, I'm not sure even what was the title of this seminar, if there is any, any title, but basically it's about what these people or we are like want to hear about. So, yeah, so, and I am really, uh, in the last two years, I, I ran this seminar from the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. I'm very grateful to the Fields Institute of hosting me and giving me the opportunity to run it, to run it from here. So the first month I want, I, uh, um, that we'll, we'll go, uh, uh, like we'll start to talk about various aspects of uh, lattices of in semi-simple Lie groups, um, many of them arithmetic groups. And I want to kind of revisit a topic which was studied quite intensively, maybe like 15, 10, 20 years ago, but I'll try to convince you that there is a, now some new direction idea which justify maybe revisit it and maybe some progress can be done related to some boundness condition on these uh, arithmetic groups, on these on these lattices, but I really want to 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 start uh, from uh, more or less from scratch, not assuming uh, too much of a low knowledge. Now I was told, by the way, that most of it is seen pretty well, but uh, people here can speak, right? So please tell me. If, uh, if the boundaries are not seen well from a distance, so what? Ah, okay, so, so this, this is okay or not? The it looks okay. Well, so I see, so the, the, I have to concentrate on this too. Okay, fine, good. Okay, so uh, so let's in uh, the 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 big subject is uh, lattices in semi-simple groups. Okay, so what we mean by semi-simple group? So let H be a semi-simple group for us will be a product. I say so goes one to L of H I of ki, ki, a local field. So by this, we mean R, C, uh, a field which are finite extension of periodic fields or also characteristic P. Uh, so this can be FQ, that, but, if you worry about that, just, uh, um, I, I want on one end to speak about the general case of semi-simple group, but frankly, uh, usually the deep questions and the, the meat is already, if you take just one simple group and you do it even over the reals, that's fine. But some people may prefer 
PRDX or we want characteristic P for various questions. So uh, let me start with everything, but then we'll stick to simple groups. So an, an HI is a say simple KI algebraic groups, and it will be convenient to assume uh, say connected as an algebraic group and even simply connected, if you know what is what it means, fine. If you don't know, maybe even better because you don't want to confuse yourself. The generic example that we want to, to think about, um, about, uh, sorry, just a second. And then let gamma in G a lattice. So this means, uh, sorry, this will be H. Now I want to keep G for later. Uh, a lattice uh, means uh, a IE discrete subgroup uh, so with finite co-volume, namely the H mod gamma carries a finite, a finite volume or equivalently there exists a, 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 a subset of finite volume of, of H a finite volume with respect to the hard measure of H as that gamma times that set is everything. Now there are lattices, there are two types of lattices. Uh, 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 if H with gamma is compact, then we say that gamma is a co-compact lattice or also uh, then we say that gamma is co-compact, oops or also uniform, and if it's not compact, then it's non-uniform lattice. Now, uh, examples, uh, well, there are, the, the, uh, the example that we'll talk mainly are arithmetic lattices. Arithmetic lattices, so, the quick definition is everything which is kind of defined by number theory. And, the, and usually in lecture, people say something like SLN Z inside H equal SLN R. So SLN R is a simply group and SLN Z is a lattice. By the way, this is a non-uniform lattice. But actually here I want to stop for a minute because most speaker in most lectures when they, they say arithmetic group, they say something like SLN Z because the definition is not completely trivial. I want to, to, I want to mention here one of the people I admire and I think uh, people forgot his contribution. This is Piatetsky Shapiro, who was I think the first to give the precise complete definition of an arithmetic group. And this opened the door for the famous work of Margulis who proved that every lattice in higher rank, we'll talk about it in a second, a, a semi-simple group is arithmetic because if you don't have the general definition of arithmetic group, you cannot really define, you cannot really prove such a theorem. So what is an arithmetic group? So, so an arithmetic group is a, is something of the following kind. Let me do it say in characteristic zero because, but, but you can also do characteristic P. So let's say that if H is such a product of H, I, K, I, and let's say that the characteristics of K, I is always zero, then gamma in H is an arithmetic lattice if there exists, okay, may, um, I can even define, okay, maybe, maybe I will say, um, yeah, okay, I'll define it like that, uh, okay, if, if there exists a number field, so it means K, so this is just a finite extension of the rational numbers and a and a finite set of valuations of k. So valuation of k is the, um, let's call it a finite set uh, S. 
and assume that S contains S infinity, which are all the Archimedean ones, the Archimedean valuations. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say an example in a second. Uh, and let's denote, let O be the ring of integers of K and OS be the S integers. These are all X in K such that V of X is greater or equal to zero for every V which is not in S. <laughs> and and uh, there exists a K algebraic group G and a map from the product of G of K V over, you see now why people don't like, in most lectures, they don't like to give the full definition of arithmetic group. Don't worry, the young people, if you find it difficult, I admit it is, will show you some example and you can forget about this definition, but I really want to write it because some I feel that if this uh, seminar is going to talk so much about arithmetic group, at least once it should be written on the blackboard. So the product over all V in S of KV. So you see, we have a K algebraic group. We can always take the points in the completion V, V in S. So we are getting an example of such a semi-simple group, right? Because it's a kind of a product. Uh, we can even say uh, the G is a simple group. Let's say uh, K algebraic simple group. Say So now we have some of, we have a product like that, which, so this is itself a semi-simple group. Now this is not exactly, this doesn't have to be equal to H, but, and, and I will show you an example in a second, you'll see why we, we it's important to do that uh, with a map um, pi, which is almost onto, it, it can be, uh, the image is co-compact in some examples, so but it's usually onto, so I'm not completely onto H. So you remember H is a product of, uh, of simple groups um, such that, eh, sorry, with compact kernel, that's important, with compact kernel, so the pi is the compact kernel such that pi of the points of G O S, you take the point of G, but just those whose coordinates are in this S arithmetic, this is called S integers, that pi of this S is commensurable to gamma. What is commensurable, it means that gamma intersection pi of G O S is a finite index in both. In both. Okay, so let me, I mean, uh, if, if, you, if you see this for the first time in your life, then clearly uh, it has no meaning somehow or too fast, but if you see some examples and, and from now on, you really can think just on this type of examples, then, um, uh, then you have, uh, you have like, so the first example is SLNZ inside SLNR. So here the G is SLN, the K is Q, the S is only the S infinity. So the OS is simply the integers, right? And we take the group and then, it, then this, is, this is kind of clear, right? And, uh, um, and another example is SLN Z one over P. I take Z, I localize it at one prime, P is some prime, one prime 
and then we think of it as sitting in SLNR cross SLNQP. You see now, again, we take G to be SLN, we take K to be, to be Q, but we take S to be <laughs> the, the infinite valuation, the Archimedean valuation, but also the P valuation, you know, the valuations, the, the, the non-Archimedean valuation are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the primes. And then we take this prime and then what we get now, look here at the little uh, uh, miracle and I explain in a minute why this is a miracle. Z one over P is a dense sub ring of R and it is a dense sub ring of QP but it is discrete in the product of the real and the, and, and the periodic. And that's why SLN is discrete in this, in discrete in this product. But, uh, um, so, but this, is, this is simple, but, but in the next example that I want to talk about, because it may come up sometimes, maybe in the future, uh, we see why this is a kind of a miracle because let's let's take a little bit more sophisticated example. I will start now with with G, not with H. So I will take G to be D one. Well, what is D one? D will be the Hamiltonian uh, quaternions, like the standard quaternions. But think of it as an algebra over any field, right? So this is, you know, it's a kind of uh, generated by uh, plus minus uh, by uh, uh, one i j and k with the with the usual relation i square equal j square equal k square equal minus one i j equal k j i equal minus k etc. Right? This is the standard Hamiltonian. I can think of it as an algebra over any field or any or, or any ring of coefficients, and d one will be. So let's define if alpha uh, is a, is a quaternion. So what is it? Is something of the form x zero plus x one i plus x two j plus x three k then we define the norm, the alpha bar to be x zero, the conjugate, the quaternionic conjugate is x zero minus x one i minus x two j minus x three k. And, and the alpha norm is equal alpha times alpha bar, which is simply sigma x i square, i goes from zero up to three. And the group of norm one element, it's a group with respect to, multiplic uh, to multiplication because the norm is multiplicative. So the norm is multiplicative. What? Ah, this I won't be, yeah, you're right, sorry. Okay, understand. So better, better to work with this, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so now I want to do the following. I want to do the following. So now let's look at D1 of the ring Z one over P. So this is, so, so, so you understand that D1, so D1 is all alpha in D, such that the norm of alpha is equal to one. Then you can see that these are all the quaternions of norm one. If you multiply two quaternions of norm one, you get a quaternion of, no, of norm one. So it's just fair to look at D1 of this ring, right? Now we can do exactly the same thing as in example number two, we can embed it in D1 of the real numbers cross D1 of the periodic numbers, QP. Okay, so, so again, the same, the same argument, right? Z1 over P is, is dense in each one, but it's discrete 
in the product. So this will be a discrete group here, the, the, here the, up to now, everything the same. But here is the miracle. This group, what is this group? These are all, uh, I mean, I, you don't have to know what's the group, but it's a group, but it's compact because this means you take four real numbers which sum up to, to one, right? So this is the sphere. It's a like as a set is a three dimensional sphere. So it's compact. So it's a compact group, right? So now we get this as a discrete group in a product of compact times this. Now, what is this? This, okay, now you have to, to know a little bit uh, about the theory of quaternion algebra. So in this standard quaternion algebra, it P is not two, then D is nothing more D of QP is nothing more than the two by two matrices that say that the quaternion algebra splits and, and, and the quaternion, uh, and, the, and, and so this is the two by two matrices and D1 of QP is SL2 QP. Okay. Because the norm, what happened, that's a little exercise you check. What happened with the norm? The norm becomes the determinant. When in, uh, in, uh, in the, so now you get, so you see, you, we got it to start with as a discrete group in this, in this product. But suddenly if we project it, you see, if we take here the group SLN Z1 over P and we project it to E or to E, we will, get, we will get a dense subgroup here. It's not completely clear. It's not just because the ring is dense here and, and, and dense here, this by itself does not imply that you can, then, but it's, it's a little theorem or not, not a difficult one. But here, you see, if you have something discrete in a product of two and one of them is compact, if you project it to the other, it's still discrete. That's an easy exercise in elementary topology. Okay. So we are getting a discrete subgroup here. So we are getting a lattice inside SL2 QP. The fact that it's a lattice, it's even a co-compact lattice here, is, needs a proof. This really needs a proof, but, but it's part of the very, very, very special case of the, of the Borel, uh, of the Borel uh, Arishandra. If somebody wants to, to, to see a very, very elegant proof, not of mine, but it appeared in my book on Expander, uh, um, uh, then you see that uh, you can deduce it from the classical Jacobi theorem on the number of ways to write, uh, uh, a number as a, as a sum of four squares, you can deduce that this is a lattice in this group. So somehow everything is related, the number theory, the, the topology and the, the and geometry and all this, uh, this is kind of cute. And actually mentioning all this, so those of you are familiar with the fact that SL2QP, the associate symmetric space, with this is the Boatitz three, which is a regular P plus one uh, three, maybe won't be surprised to hear that by taking this arithmetic group, taking congruent subgroups of it, which we'll talk about today, then, uh, and you let, when you look at, the, at the, this infinite three, you divide it by these congruent subgroups, you get finite graphs, and these are Ramanujan graph, which are optimal expander, et cetera, et cetera. I'm actually going to give you a talk not part of our seminar next Friday, part of some uh, a symposium. The boss, the boss doesn't know about that. <laughs> with uh, the with, uh, people from Hamilton, you know this. Uh, and, then, and then I will elaborate on that. Maybe I should send a message to the people in the, in the, in the, in the mailing list. But, but that's not the direction I want to take today. Okay, so in okay, so so no no in this example, these are all the no no okay so so okay so 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 you uh, so you are right. I mean what in this definition I'm always getting the so-called irreducible lattices. 
and usually, but, but if it's not irreducible, uh, okay, you're right. Then G won't be simple. So D will be semi-simple. Okay, so I exactly was hesitated whether to write simple or not. Okay, there are people here who are too smart and knows too much. <laughs> I know that. Yeah, but you're right, you're right, you're right. Okay. Anyway, I mean, I want, but but I I I I really have a reason to to present such 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 an example, because this is the typical situation, and and this will come up, maybe even today, uh, that if you define a co-compact lattice, like, like a uniform lattice, then you kind of need, to, in the definition, you need to have something which you see this um, um you see now according to our definition i can take h to be only this one right because you remember in my definition i i'm afraid i erased it already i said that the map from g of something blah 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 to h should have a compact kernel that's okay that's exactly what happened here if this is my h now I take this and I, I, I project it to H and I have a compact kernel, right? So if you, if you get it here, somehow you don't see this compact part, but that's the compact part is crucial because without it, you would not be able to know that this is discrete because if, if, I, if I just tell you that Z one over P embedded to QP, you, you would tell me why this is discrete. It should be, dense it's discrete because of the miracle that it's discrete in the product of the periodic and the real and the real part is compact so uh, uh, now uh, now this kind of uh, a difference between co-compact lattice and and, uh, and, uh, and uniform lattice and non-uniform lattice is also res responsible from at least from one point of view to the fact that Uniform lattices, co-compact lattices, never contain unipotent elements because the compact group. Because even if we don't see it, there is even a compact group. You see, the same lattice here is embedded here and embedded here, and it's injective here and injective here. And in a compact group, you don't have unipotent elements. One can prove directly that compact groups don't have, compact, compact lattices don't have unipotent element, but somehow, in a way, this is one of the reasons behind that, at least for arithmetic lattices. And now, one of the things I want to, to kind of convince you today, and uh, yeah, I'm, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Kumar, uh, Marty was supposed to talk next week, cannot, do it so I I I I'm, that's I decided that's enabled me to go slower as you can see, and I will talk also next week. I will make sure, by the way, that the two lectures will be essentially independent. What's the people who who miss this one? But uh, but uh, um, uh, and I think if I will not manage to do it today, I will next week. I I'll explain uh, for a number of years. Um, some of us, many of us, thought that bounded generation is kind of a, 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 a key to prove congruence of property and many other things. And the very surprising results, which just came up last year, showed that um, uniform lattices are never boundedly generated. The sum of for being boundedly generated, it's essential to have unipotent. Without unipotent, somehow it doesn't work. And so we have to find other bounded generation. And part of the seminar that's exactly in the lectures will come up uh, of Fenir Avni and Chen Meiri in the two weeks after that, even though the titles are about logic and model theory, it's really about bounded generation from a different kind. So even if you're not interested in model theory, uh, uh, you'll see that the model theory is kind of a language to talk about this type of question. Okay, let me let me continue. Uh, uh, okay, so there are other examples, but and there are some examples which are not arithmetic. But uh, um, I'll say something about them, but I don't want to part because uh, 
uh, even <laughs> uh, it's going slower even than the slow mode I plan. Uh, so uh, so let me, uh, but I, I think I'm already, once I have this definition, I'm, I'm kind of ready to talk about the congruent subroute property. But now uh, those who lost me, you don't have to worry. You can really uh, always think about this example, SLN Z in, in, inside SLN R. Uh, or uh, the symplectic group over Z or symplectic group over ring of integers or whatever, that the, the nicest examples usually you meet already most of the deep stuff already, already there. Okay, so now I want to talk about the congruence subgroup property or problem first. The congruent subgroup, you see, usually if you take, if G is a kind of a simple group, like SLN, SP, 2G, or various, then classical theorems going back to the 19th century tell you that if, you, if F is a field, then typically, I, I don't want now to get to the precise, typically a simple group up to the center. It has a center like SLN, we know SLNF is always a simple group model when if you divide it by the by the by the little center uh, um, up to the center. Now, if I look at such, if I look at such a group G over OS, right? That's that's the kind of arithmetic groups that we we talked about, right? G of OS. This is certainly not a simple group. Or just think of G of Z. Right? It cannot be a simple group. Why? Right? There are clear examples. The kernel from G of Z to G of Z mod MZ, if you divide the group by some ideal, you divide the ring by some ideal, this kernel is a normal subgroup, right? And it's a normal finite index subgroup. And the congruent subgroup pro problem is basically whether all groups are like that. What we mean like that? So, so uh, if I is an ideal in OS, then uh, ideal say not zero ideal and all ideals by the way in such rings are always of finite index, then the kernel from G O S to G O S mod I is called the principle is it possible to see that it, uh, uh, it's okay when I write here? Yeah, I think it's okay. It's a principal congruence subgroup and every, and every subgroup, maybe I should use this. And uh, um, if, uh, if say, uh, Lambda is a subgroup of GOS. I call maybe from now on GOS like that. I will call it gamma. Contains some principle congruent subgroup. Then lambda is called. Congruent subgroup. So every congruent subgroup is a finite index, and the congruent subgroup problem, congruence subgroup problem, which is kind of a natural extension of the, it's a natural question, elementary question, just like if you believe that G of F is a simple group, then you may think that. Okay, if you take G of a ring, then the only normal subgroup are those coming from ideals in, in the ring. So the congruent subgroup problem is, is every, you can ask whether every normal subgroup, but it's better to ask it, whether a, a, is every finite index subgroup of GOS, a congruent subgroup. Okay.
uh, well, in many cases it's known. In, in, in some cases it's open. I will, I will, I will say more later. But let me switch to a different language uh, to present this problem. This problem can be presented in in a, in a different language. I think it's due to cell. how to think about, rethink about this problem. We look at gamma. So gamma is this GOS. Again, just you can think about gamma equal SLNZ. Define two topologies on gamma. One is now that is called the, the, it's called sometimes the arithmetic topology, but really more natural to call it uh, at this point, the, the profinite topology. Now, what is the profinite topology of the group? On, on every group, uh, on every set, right? If you, def if you want to define the topology, you have, you have to define what are the open set, or it's enough to define what are the open neighborhoods of every point. If you have a group, it's a suffices to define the open neighborhoods of the identity element and all other open uh, neighborhoods are just uh, translations by, by the group element, right? This way you get a topological structure, topological group. So the profinite topology, that's completely general. For every group, I want to define a topology. I have to define what are the open neighborhoods of the, the identity. So the, the profinite topology is the one for which all finite index subgroups are open. Right? They are the open neighborhoods of the identity. And, but I can also define if gamma is arithmetic group, that that's can define for every group. The second topology is the congruence topology. What is the congruence topology? Is the one that the congruence subgroups form, the congruence subgroups are the open neighborhoods. Only them, not, the, not all. Okay, of the identity. So the congruence double problem is whether the two topologies are the same, right? Now, to say that the two topologies are the same, let me tell you that there is now also a, quantita a, a, a quantitative way to measure that, not just qual quantitative. So let, now the identity map or take the identity map from gamma to gamma. So gamma is our arithmetic group, G of Z of G or G of OS. The identity map is continuous, let's be careful, from the stronger topology to the weaker topology, right? Which one is the stronger? The profinite. The congruence may be equal or may be weaker. So the identity is continuous map, homomorphism, from gamma with the profinite topology to gamma with the congruence topology, right? Now, if you have a topology on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a group uh, when defined uh, uh, neighborhoods of the identity, there is a standard way to take completion. You can define it in an abstract way like you have a topology if the if the if the met, if the space is not uh, is not uh, complete you can take cauchy sequences you know like uh, at least when i was a student they still taught it in even in undergraduate how to construct the real number from the from the rational by cauchy equivalent task of cauchy sequences you can apply the same thing on ever, whenever you have a topology on such a group and take completion. But in this case, actually, uh, we have the completion, the profinite completion. So this is 
the completion of gamma with respect to the profinite topology is nothing more than the inverse limit of gamma mod n, where n runs over all finite index subgroup of gamma, and the congruence completion, gamma, I just write it gamma bar, maybe I'll stress now, I'll write congruence so that we'll remember what we mean. So it's the congruence completion is the same thing, but you run over only the same thing, but now if N is congruence, normal congruence sample. So you run over a smaller system, so it's a smaller group. And you have a map from ear to ear, and now the congruence subgroup problem as an affirmative solution the congruence subgroup problem is an affirmative answer if and only if gamma hat is equal gamma hat gamma bar i.e. if and only if uh, 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 I should call uh, uh, if and only if ID hat, maybe I'll call it ID, I can call it ID hat, from gamma hat to gamma bar is an isomorphism. Now it's always an epimorphism because gamma goes to gamma and gamma is dense here and gamma is dense here. So, and this is compact, so the image must be closed, and so it's epimorphism. So the real question, so congruence subgroup problem is positive if and only if the care of, of ID bar is trivial. But after saying all this, I want to change the terminology. I'll explain in a minute why. Experience showed, and I will explain in a minute. Experience showed, and I, will, I want to convince you that the congruence of property is extremely important. It has many applications. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of an amazing story because it started already in the, in the 19th century. I'll be saying something, you know, it's a kind of a natural, naive question, you know, if G of, of a, if, if G of a, of a field is simple, G of a ring you think will be, you know, almost simple except of the clear normal subgroups. But it turns out to be extremely important with many applications. It was kind of the starting point of algebraic K theory, etc. But that's not the direction we'll take. I will connect it with the general theory of lattices, super rigidity, uh, uh, etc. When I say I, I don't mean I. I mean, it was done by some great mathematicians already uh, uh, years ago. But um, we will define the following. Let's say that gamma, again, GOS, is CSP, congruent subgroup property. That's nowadays the standard terminology. If the kernel of this is finite. The point is that it turns out that all the applications, the big application of the congruence of property can be obtained also if it's finite. There are many interesting examples that you get finite and then you can put it in a nice, in a nice picture. So now let me tell you after, after that, what is, um, what do we know and how to put it in some uh, kind of more general framework. Uh, 
there is, okay, so up to now, we, we really basically gave only definition, et cetera. Let me say some history and some, and some result. It turns out, if, again, if H is such a product of H, I, K, I, a semi-simple group, then rank of H is equal to the sum I goes from one to L of the rank over K I of H I. Each one of the H I is an algebraic group over the field K I. A rank of a group over a field is the dimension of the maximal split tori over that field. If you know what I'm talking about, fine. If you don't know, even better, because you don't really have to know what is really uh, the rank of SLN over every field, doesn't matter what the field, is always N minus one. So SL2 is rank one, SLN is rank N minus one. So, and we say that the group is I rank, H or H is I rank or is I rank or is an I rank group, it doesn't have to be too much I, too, 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 too I. If rank of A is at least two, it's not rank one. By the way, rank zero is compact. So we don't care about compact. We kind of, if you notice, we, at some of the, because we're interested on the lattices, we're interested in the discrete subgroup of finite covolume, in some way, they don't see the compact. I mean, the compact is important to keep it at the back of our mind, as I illustrated at the beginning, but somehow, if you project it without the compact, you are still fine. Now, in this theory, yeah. Yes, the, the fact that it is finite, yes. The, the, the language would be the following, that every, every non-congruent subgroup, if you take its closure in the congruence topology, it's bounded. You have to say the of the volume. What? You have to say the volume. Right, okay. I, what I'm going to, to show, I mean, uh, next time, I'm going to show you that's part of the philosophy that I'm going to push very strongly. I'm going to show you that the congruence of property, even though it is, you know, defined with a lot of arithmetic, can be completely defined by using purely group, the uh, group theory. For example, for your interest, it will be meaningful to us whether hyperbolic groups have the congruence of property, even if they don't have any arithmetic structure. That's exactly the point I'm going to make, okay? But this is only preview probably, well, maybe I'll say something even today. Um, gamma is I rank if the rank is at least two. Now in the theory of lattices, more or less there is a philosophy which going, one should be careful because it's not always the case, but somehow there is rank one lattices in rank one groups behave in one way and lattices in I rank groups uh, behave in a different way. And it, but this, this is not always the case. Some questions suddenly run, some, some rank one behave like rank two, usually in this direction, not in the opposite direction. For example, the most famous theorem in all these theory, this is the work of Margulis, you know, built on uh, Selberg and Mosto, strong rigidity, but I don't have, I'm not going. Margulis proved super rigidity. What is super rigidity? Let me just say it without writing down. Uh, uh, so uh, Margulis proved that if you have a lattice in the I rank group, which is an irreducible lattice, I, which I didn't say, but maybe let me say because, uh, because the lecture is recorded, so I don't want to cheat. And a lattice is called irreducible, basically, if cannot be factor to, to you cannot factor H to two parts and it's a lattice here and a lattice here. It's really honestly a lattice which sits in the product. 
namely if in every proper quotient it is dense. Okay, it's not built from just uh, taking two different lenses. So, so uh, Margulis super did he said that if you take, and again, if you take a simple group, then every lattice is reducible. We don't have to worry about that. So super rigidity means that you, you take, you take a, a represent a finite dimensional, again, a finite dimensional representation of gamma of the discrete group. Think about finite dimensional representation of SLNZ. You can extend it up to a finite index to a representation of SLNR this is true if n is greater or equal three, namely i rank. So again, let's repeat it. It's an it's an it's an amazing theorem if you think about that, because you start with a with a representation of a discrete group which you know nothing about basically, um, and well, some represent. Uh, so so what type of representation you know? You know the representation of S L N Z which factor through finite quotients. Right, okay, every finite quotient, you get a finite group. Finite group is representation theory, which is very well developed subject. There are other representations, like take SLNR. SLNR is a lot of representation. I'm talking only about finite dimensional, but they are fully understood and classified by uh, what is called the weights of the, of the, you know, of the, of the root system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a, another classical theory. Basically, super rigidity tells you that every representation of gamma is either finite or this, or a, or a kind of an easy combination of the two. Okay, now this is now this is true for SLNZ if n greater or equal three. It's far from being true for SL2Z. Why? SL2Z is essentially a free group, it has a free subgroup. Of finite index. So representation of it and representation of free group are essentially the same. But free group is awfully a lot of representations. You know, free group you can send, you can send a free group on onto SL3Z or onto SL5Z. You cannot send SL2R onto SL5R. So you cannot expect something like that. And that's exactly the dichotomy between rank one, SL2 rank one, and SLNZ. But Margulis went farther and he used super agility to prove that every lattice in I rank group is an arithmetic lattice, is built out of such, out of such, uh, uh, out of such uh, construction as I described. He did use it from super agility. That, that was kind of, by nowadays, is a standard argument but uh, it was a kind of an amazing uh, development. It's not such a complicated one. I, I, I will not go to this direction, but, um, but it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing uh, 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 argument. So again, in I rank, every lattice in arithmetic. In rank one, not every lattice in arithmetic. There are many arithmetic lattices. But some surprises came later on that I will come later about rank one here. I don't want to stop. For that, but I do want to go to Ser. Ser posed the general conjecture about the congruence of property. The congruence of property in this language, namely that gamma is the congruence of property if the kernel is finite. So Ser conjecture, um, so maybe I'll write it now over there. Which kind of that's the leading conjecture in the last, I can now say exactly 50 years. He put it on print in in a, in a paper of him in the Annals of Mathematics in 1972. So assume G. So I I, I uh, Assume G is a simple, simply connected, connected algebraic group over a number field. You take G O S to be as before. Then you see gamma equal G O S. Now you remember this always sits in the product of I goes between one 
A, how goes over all V in S of G, K, V. You remember this now, this, this is a finitely generated group. You know, it's kind of group, it's a countable group. Now, these are the completions. So these are local fields. So these are product of Lie groups. Some of them are periodic, some of them are real. And Cotistic P also, the, the same story. So Ser conjecture says, and extremely interesting, so that gamma is congruent subgroup property, namely the kernel is finite, if and only if the sigma of the rank over V in S of, of, uh, of G is at least two, namely rank greater or equal to, do have congruent sub property, rank one, never have congruent sub property. Okay. Now, in the last 50 years, a lot of this conjecture was proved. It's still open. I promise Kasra and, uh, and Abdul that I will show you a connection to problems you're interested. And let me tell you that I dare to believe now, I admire Sir and everything, that Sir conjecture is wrong. I mean, it's almost true, but I think there might be cases in which it's wrong. And if it's wrong, there is a dramatic application. So, and I want to, and I want to explain that. Uh, somehow at least to encourage uh, some thinking about, about this. So let me talk for a minute about rank one groups. What are the rank one, just over the reals? If you take rank one groups over the periodics or rank one groups over a cadistic P, some conjecture is by now fully known. Over the reals, there is, there is a little story. Uh, rank one groups over the real number. So like if, if it's, uh, what are the Lie groups of rank one? Here is the list of all of them up to the center. S, O, N, one, you know, these are the, the groups preserving the quadratic forms of type X one square plus X two square plus X N square minus X N plus one square, which is also the automorphism group of hyperbolic spaces, uh, real hyperbolic spaces, S, U, N, one, uh, uh, complex hyperbolic spaces, preserving them. These are Hermitian form over the complex number. S, P, and one, which define as the groups reserving this kind of an Hermitian form over the Hamiltonian uh, algebra. And another exceptional group that don't worry about. There's another group. But experience shows that there is a real difference between this and this. Surprisingly, really surprisingly at the time, Corlett and then uh, Gromov and Schoen showed that these groups have the uh, well, the, uh, before them, it was shown that they have Kashdan property T. By the way, Kashdan property T is another a very important property, which again, kind of when it started, it was uh, the, uh, 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 it was kind of rank greater or equal to F Kashdan property T, rank one, don't. But it turns out that that's not precise. Again, the philosophy influenced people to believe that that's the case, and then then uh, it turns out that they have Kashdan property T, but they also have super rigidity, super rigidity, which was proved by Margulis only for rank greater or equal to, was proved later on also for these rank one groups and super rigidity implied arithmeticity that every lattice is arithmetic. And this is true also here. So that's called arithmeticity that every lattice is of the kind I described 
I, I, I described before. Here, super GT is not true, and there, uh, here it's known at all of them, there are non-arithmetic lattices, um, small dimension, it was, uh, we should mention the, the work, old work of Winberg who passed away recently, but then Gromov and Piotrowski Shapiro uh, constructed non-arithmetic lattices for every N. In SUN1, the, 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 this is still a, a big problem about arithmeticity. Uh, um, Non-arithmetic lattices are known only in dimension two and three. This is work of, uh, of uh, Mosto and Delin and Ron Livne. But in higher dimensional, it's still, it, it's not known, but super rigidity does not work, at least for some lattices. So people don't believe that we are going to get, and I, I, we cannot expect it, but here we, we, did, we, we did get. So sometimes I like to call these lattices, uh, to call them lattices of rank one and a half because in, in some way they behave, even though they rank one, they behave like rank two. And actually I do believe that they do have the congruent sabu property or this potentially. And I, I dare even to ask Sir, and he told me you may be right. I mean, I made a conjecture in 72 based on the known information at that time and nothing of this was known. But let me, let me explain why proving the congruent sabu property in even for one lattice, co-compact lattice, say, in SPN1 will have a dramatic application. So let me do that. And maybe, uh, I don't know if we'll have time to say more than that today. So, uh, <clears throat> So um, every, here is a fact, every co-compact lattice in a real rank one simple Lie group is hyperbolic group in the sense of Gromov. It's sometimes called Gromov hyperbolic. So this is a very important class of groups. I hope most, at least most of the audience here uh, know what it is. I, I, I will not, I will not define. Uh, a long-standing open problem is whether a long standing open problem due to Gromov, but it's already at least 30 or 40 years old, is every hyperbolic group residually finite. What does it mean residually finite? Residually finite means, well, we can define it in several different ways, but residually finite basically means that the intersection of all the normal subgroups of gamma of finite index is trivial. Namely, you can separate the points of gamma by, you can separate the points of gamma by homomorphisms to finite groups. Now, assume, okay, so I want to combine this and here is an observation. If, Now, by the way, uh, 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 every linear group, every finitely generated linear group is residually finite. Kind of most of the groups you meet in the street are residually finite. You know, the automorphism group of three groups, the mapping class group, uh, yeah, in the symplectic world. If it's finitely generated, what? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Now it's all discrete, and and uh, I also finitely generated. I call it bottom two. All right. So usually, I mean, for the for the, the definition, you don't need, but but uh, but uh, uh, yeah. So um, but there are some non-residually finite. I think nowadays, I don't know, Casa, uh, you should tell me. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure people believe that there exists non-residually finite hyperbolic group, or it's still what the experts think. There should be. Okay, so here is a little observation. If there exists a co-compact arithmetic, well, they're all arithmetic, a co-compact lattice in SPN1 or in F4 minus 20. You remember, oh, I erased it. You remember I told you that these groups are the rank one and a half. You know, uh, here uh, the, the cell conjecture is a little bit uh, suspicious, right? Maybe it's wrong. So I want to tell you, I mean, at least wishful thinking that he is wrong. Maybe it's not wrong. Maybe it's still, uh, it's still right. But uh, if there's this co-compact lattice in SPN1 with the congruent subgroup property, then there exists a non-residually finite hyperbolic group. So this will give an answer to this long-standing problem of chrome. Let me let me explain why. You see, the gamma itself is uh, uh, the gamma itself. Alex, Alex, before you erase it, okay, you already erased it. But uh, but um, you, you always speak about uh, the direction from right to left. Is the converse uh, easy or well known? Or maybe you mentioned something and I missed it. Like that. Uh, somehow somehow I, I uh, it's difficult to hear. I mean, I hear you, but somehow not. So my question is whether it is clear uh, to hold for higher rank gr uh, groups. Oh, no, uh, that, that they have congruence of property? Yes. No, no, it's far from being clear. It was proved in most cases. Okay, this will come up in my talk. It will come in Niravni talk. It will come in Chen Meiri talk. By now, the situation, uh, yeah, I really had to say that. That's, I'm starting to be <laughs> nervous about the time. Okay, but let me, let, me, let me not postpone it. In higher rank, in rank greater or equal to, there is a very general, uh, it's a long history. Many great people contributed. The most general theorem is by Ragunatan who proved that all non-uniform lattices have the congruence of property. For co-compact lattices, for uniform lattices, it's known for some of them, those coming from orthogonal groups, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Nir and Chen will, will, will mention them, but it's strongly believed that indeed it always correct. I think nobody uh, 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 doubt that. But I think I'm not the only one who doubt whether the negative part of uh, Let me say, I had to say it at the beginning, I had to say even before starting all this, you see, the starting point of Serre was that SL2Z is negative solution to the congruence of property. In fact, the kernel from the profinite completion in this case, actually give me some pleasure to mention that because I did it when I was younger than some of you here, the kernel from SL2Z hat to SL2Z to the, the congruence completion is this. I will come back to this story. In this case, is huge. It's not finite. It's the free profinite group on a countable number of generators. It's a kind of a, a group, an important group, which appears a lot in Galva theory. On the other end, if you replace here n greater or equal three, then the kernel is trivial. And basically, this is the prototype, right? It's a failure in rank one, and it's success in higher rank. But 
SL to Z maybe mis um, um, uh, misleads us because this is a lattice in SO and one because SL two R is SO two is SO two one right? Okay, so let me just uh, just uh, I, 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 uh, uh, prove this observation. So now gamma itself is linear. And therefore, Resdoli finite, that's not the group I promised you. I promised you to find an hyperbolic group, which is not Resdoli finite, right? But uh, it's a non result. It's, again, it's basically Gromov, but uh, Gromov and others. Uh, if, if you look at gamma modulo some, then this is my notation. Uh, to the normal closure of W. You take W, some very long word, say W, generic long word. You take the generator and you take a very long word in the generators. Then usually, then this, so the normal closure of this word is an infinite group. And this quotient is also hyperbolic. That's the, the fact that it's, uh, infinite important uh, infinite normal sag of it's not a big deal if you take w to be of infinite order then clearly the normal closure of it is infinite but this is still infinite and this is an hyperbolic group now i claim let's call it let's call it lambda now i claim that such lambda is not resdoli finite assuming gamma as the congruence of property why Why? Um, lambda is not Resdoli finite. Okay, and that will be the counter example because it's hyperbolic and not Resdoli finite. Otherwise, uh, gamma uh, lambda is infinitely many normal subgroups of finite index, normal finite index subgroups. Uh, I don't know, call them uh, MI, normal in lambda. And now let's say that the projection from gamma to onto lambda, let's call it pi. And let's call Ni to be the pre-image of Mi in gamma. Okay? So all of them, every one of the Ni contains the normal closure of such W by definition. But according, but uh, uh, by our assumption, Each Ni is a congruent subgroup, right? Because we assume that all the subgroups of finite index are congruent subgroup. And even if it's uh, the weak congruent subgroup property, it's up to a bounded, that's not, right? Ah, but that's impossible, why? So here is a, is a, is a, is a simple claim, intersection, in an arithmetic group, in a general arithmetic group like that, of infinitely many normal, normal, I want to stress, congruence subgroups is always trivial or, it, or at least uh, finite, central. Think about, think about SL3Z, or think about SL5Z, you take, Normal subgroups, they're basically like saying, you know, congruent to one mod P or mod to one M. If you're congruent to one mod something for infinitely many numbers, then you must be one, right? You cannot be congruent to one without being one for infinitely many prime. So it means that all the intersection of all these Ni should be trivial or finite at least, right? But they all contains this 
normal subgroup finite index, a uh, no, uh, 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 infinite normal, normal subgroup. So this is a contradiction. So you cannot have infinitely many normal congruent subgroup containing this group, and therefore the quotient cannot be raised only finite. In fact, we are proving something much stronger, and, and you might, may think maybe this is impossible. We are proving here that this lambda, not only that it's not raised only finite, it has only finitely many normal subgroups of finite index. And therefore, because every finite index subgroup contains a normal subgroup of finite index, it has only finitely many finite index subgroups. And so this much stronger than just not being raised only finite. So you may think, ah, this is, ah, that's maybe cannot. No. In fact, I think it was Danny Weiss or Danny Weiss with somebody else who proved that if there exists a non-residually finite hyperbolic group, then there exists an hyperbolic group without any finite index subgroups. So we are getting the stronger conclusion. Of course, we are not getting it, only conditional on the, on the congruent subgroup property to all. Okay, I'm already uh, uh, my, my time. The one thing which I didn't do, I'll try to, to do it next time. Uh, there is a beautiful, beautiful argument of Ser, which is very short, and I'll, I'll, that congruent subgroup property implies super rigidity. You see, it doesn't really, it's not as famous as it should because it came after super rigidity. And also the, the big deal with super rigidity was that the super rigidity implies arithmeticity. Here we start with an arithmetic group and we say, if it has the congruent subgroup property, I can deduce super rigidity. But it's such a beautiful argument that I try to put it ne uh, next time. And then I will pass to talk about what was supposed to tie the, the topic of today, which is the boundness condition. And this will be the preparation for the two talks after that of Avni and Tenmir. I'm sorry I went over my time. I tried it, it won't happen again. And uh, so we, we, I thought that maybe we'll discuss it, but maybe of uh, all the, uh, thank you all uh, the loyal audience <laughs> who come <laughs> Uh, I'll come to this. Uh, please uh, uh, write me email. First of all, if you if, if you are not on the list and you are, uh, because I I don't trust machines and I don't trust with all respect the Fields Institute. I don't know if, if you are getting, I every week I send the messages about uh, if you are not, or if you know some other people who want to be on my <laughs> private uh, mailing list, please send me email. And also, please send me uh, emails if you have suggestions for, to for topics to discuss, speakers, or, or something uh, of that kind. And see you all uh, next week. So we will change the program that I will talk next week because I'm not uh, I'm not, uh, not. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I have like a very loyal audience. <laughs> Say thank you. <laughs> uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, yes. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Who is this? Yeah. Francesco. So this hi. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th this um this uh the linear phenomenon where you have uh finite central extensions that are not residually finite. Yeah. This is I, a high rank phenomenon. This is, well, this is sometimes an high rank phenomenon. It's not a general high rank phenomenon. I, I opt to mention this because that's another co a connection of the congruence of property with the problem. I hinted about that in the, in the abstract about connection with the problem of an, a, are there non sophi groups, etc. I may say mm -hmm. something about that, but uh, now I see that probably I will not have. <laughs> Uh, time to say more than few sentences, but uh, we'll see. I, I have okay. to I have to prepare again. Uh, I don't want to talk more than uh, more than next time. Just next time enough. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Bye to all of you.